Hi. So this talk is about uh, RP filter, as you could guess. Uh, I believe most of you know what RP filter is, or at least have some idea uh, about what it does. In this talk, I'm going to make the scope a little bit larger, uh, because I'm going to first start uh, developing on what the IETF says about uh, what I will call RPF. Uh, so I will make a distinction uh, for the purpose of this call between RPF, the algorithms um, defined by the IETF, and RP filter, uh, the Linux kernel implementations. And as we will see, there are several uh, of these implementations in the kernel. So what is RPF? Um, let's say we have a router here in the middle uh, connected to different networks. And with RPF, the general idea is that the router, instead of just routing packets depending on the destination address, it would also validate uh, some, the source address of incoming packets. So here, for example, we receive a packet from network blue, and it will verify that uh, the I source IP address of the packet actually belongs to network blue and not network red. The objective is to limit uh, problems caused by IP address spoofing on the internet. Uh, let's say, for example, here we have uh, an attacker uh, inside network green, and this attacker wants to attack uh, the victim in blue. So it sends a packet to the server in red, but instead of setting the source IP address with its own address, it used the IP address of the victim. So when the server receives the packet, it replies to the victim. And there are two benefits for the attacker. Uh, first, uh, its IP address never leaks to the network, so the victim has no idea where the attack actually uh, comes from. And also, uh, when we choose carefully the server, we have a nice amplification factor. Uh, so the attacker can send just small packets, and the server would reply with uh, much bigger packets. So there are protocols that are famous uh, for uh, doing that, uh, like SNMP, for example. So this problem has been known for a very long time, and even some old RFCs, like RFC 1812, requirements for IPv4 routers, uh, it defines uh, a basic algorithm to do some uh, source IP address uh, validation. Unfortunately, even at that time, it was clear that it would break some uh, routing topologies, so it was recommended to not turn it on. Then came RFC 2827, which is more uh, commonly referred to with the best current practice, so BCP uh, 38 that it belongs to. BCP man, uh, is just a collection of RFC. Uh, unfortunately, this uh, RFC didn't really uh, provide any technical solution. Uh, it just talked about using access control list. It just said that source uh, IP address validation was important, but it didn't say how to do that. But the IETF has continued to work on this problem, and we now have two new other RFCs, uh, RFC 3704 and 8704. And we will see what are the algorithms uh, they uh, define. So this first RFC uh, defines uh, four different flavors of RPF. We have strict RPF, loose, lose RPF, ignoring default routes, and feasible reverse, reverse pass forwarding, feasible RPF. The strict RPF is really the simplest and most intuitive version. Uh, so here we have a router connected to two gateways, uh, bringing to two different networks. So with strict RPF, uh, what this router does is when it receives a packet from gateway blue, it will look at the source IP address. And if this IP address belongs to network blue, it will route the packet normally. And if it belongs to another network, either network red or it's not routed at all, uh, it drops the packet. So this is the original uh, idea that we found even in the oldest RFC. 
uh, the problem is that it has always been clear that it would break asymmetric routing. So here, for example, we have two nodes, node A and B. They can communicate between each other between two gateways, blue and red, but node A is configured to only use a gateway blue, and node B is configured to only use gateway red. So when node B receives a packet from node A from gateway blue, it will do the strict RPF uh, control, and it will realize that normally the node A is routed through gateway red, although it received the packet from gateway blue, so it will drop the packet. And same thing with node A. It receives packet from uh, node B through gateway red, but it would route it through gateway blue. So RPF, strict RPF, has actually uh, broken communication between our two nodes. So another uh, variant of RPF that was defined was loose RPF. So the loose version uh, doesn't actually take the input interface into account. So it just verifies that the packet uh, is actually rotable, uh, that the source IP address of the packet is actually rotable. So in this case, we have uh, when the router receives a packet from gateway blue, it will just do a route lookup uh, on the source IP address. And if the source IP address is routable, it will just route the packet normally, even if the source address belongs to network red. Obviously, if the router even has uh, a default route, uh, loose RPF is going to uh, let almost any packet go because, yeah, as soon as it's routable, uh, then it flows. That's why we have the special variant of loose RPF ignoring uh, default route, uh, where the default route uh, actually can't be used uh, for the route lookup, but it doesn't really make any difference in practice. Uh, for example, in our case, uh, Gateway Blue, or uh, an attacker from Network Blue could still spoof an, IP, spoof an IP address from Network Red. So the fourth uh, variant of RPF that was defined in RFC 3704 is feasible RPF. Feasible RPF is interesting because it uses some extra information that were not used uh, in the other variants. So we actually use all the information that are available through the different uh, dynamic routing uh, mechanisms. So let's say that we're using BGP. Here we have a different autonomous system. So at the bottom we have AS0 that uh, announces uh, different routes, while here it's the same route. So it's 2001 DB8 A slash 48. It's announced to AS1 and to AS2. And eventually AS4 uh, learns about this route. Uh, and the AS pass uh, is longer on the red side. So it, for routing purples, AS4 doesn't uh, takes the route from AS3 into account. But with feasible RPF uh, for incoming packets, AS4 would accept packets uh, with source IP address 2001DB8A48 uh, as a source IP, uh, even though it, would, it wouldn't use it to send packets because of uh, feasible RPF and because it was announced uh, on the other interface too. <coughs> but that wasn't enough for all practical use cases. So um, actually the IETF has continued working uh, on this problem and has defined a new RFC, uh, which is RFC 8704, with two uh, new variants of uh, RPF. So they're all based on the idea of a feasible uh, RPF, but yeah, the algorithm gets a little bit more complex, yet even the acronym, as you can see, uh, is getting complex. So the idea here is, again, to use the information we can collect with BGP. And instead of checking the um, 
um, the origin of the source IP address, we will check the reachability of the autonomous system that this source address belongs to. So for example, uh, this is algorithm A, so that's the first algorithm defined in this RFC. We have AS0 that sends, uh, that announces a route uh, to AS1 and a, and a different route to AS2. And finally, AS3 receives uh, the announcement for both routes. And with this ERPF, uh, e, uh, the enhanced visible pass uh, RPF, uh, will accept packets from any of these prefix, uh, no matter if it's received uh, from AS1 or from AS2, because these prefix both belong to AS0, and AS0 is the uh, origin AS in both uh, AS paths. And in practice, there are also problems with um, routes uh, that are not propagated uh, to all the autonomous systems. So the IETF has defined algorithm B so that um, a network administrator could uh, work around this problem by putting interfaces into an interface group. So here we have AS0 who announced routes to AS1 and AS2, it's the same route, but AS2 doesn't propagate this route to AS3. But uh, this is worked around uh, with the administrator putting both interfaces into the same interface group. So now AS3 can send packets with source IP address uh, belonging to this route, even if it arrives from AS2, it will be accepted by uh, AS3 because uh, it's in the same um, uh, interface group as AS1 and it would be accepted uh, if it had arrived on AS1. So as you can see, RPF has become uh, something much more uh, complex uh, and complete than just a simple route lookup on the source IP address. And we need some information that are not available uh, by the kernel to actually implement them. Okay, so enough uh, with the theory. Now let's see how uh, the Linux kernel implements uh, RP filter. So as I said, we have several RP filter implementations. We have one CCTL for RPv4, and then the IP tables, IP6 tables, and NF tables modules that all have their own implementation. So that's three IPv4 implementation, two IPv6 implementations. So here how we can configure them. Uh, you can see that in the slide offline. Uh, all these implementations support strict and loose RPF. Uh, there's a special option uh, for loose RPF with all these modules. And beyond the limitation we already saw uh, in the theoretical RPF algorithms, we have to face uh, some kernel specific problems. So first we have five implementation to keep synchronized and we have the fact that the kernel doesn't handle IPv4 and IPv6 routing tables in the same way. And we also have kernel advanced uh, routing features so we'll see in detail uh, what are these problems. So first, let's see just how RP filter interacts with uh, regular routing tables. So here we have a route that is defined to uh, use two different uh, output interfaces. So what happens is that with most of the RP filter implementation, we can receive uh, packets uh, from any of these interfaces. Just uh, the NF table IPv6 implementation only allows uh, one of the interfaces. If you we do the same kind of configuration but with a more recent um, commands, uh, let's say, so we, we use next hop groups uh, instead of uh, a single route with uh, several next hop as we did before, we get the exact same result. So 
I'm not going to go too much into the details about why it's the case, but uh, it, it happens that uh, the problem stands in how uh, RP filter handles ECMP uh, routes, because what we did in these two examples uh, is create an equal cost multipass uh, route. So yeah, uh, RP filter and RP uh, the IPv4 and IPv6 implementation handle that uh, in different ways, which leads to different results. Now let's see uh, what happens when we define the same route twice, but with different gateways. So we can do that with IP route append, and let's see what happens. So this time we don't have an ECMP route. So what happens is that most, uh, most implementations with will only accept uh, the first route, and only the IP6 tables RP filter implementation will accept packets from any of these uh, interfaces. And again, that's uh, slightly handled about how the kernel handles ECMP, even though we didn't explicitly want an ECMP route, but IP, IPv6 internally converts uh, these routes into an, a single IC, ECMP route. And yeah, the rest is implementation detail. Uh, that yeah, I'm not going through that now because we won't have time. Now let's see a more common use case, which is to define the same route but with different preference. So here we have uh, preference uh, 1000 and preference 2000. They use two different interfaces. A preference is like metric. Uh, you can use yeah, uh, whatever the, the keyword, however you call it. Uh, it works the same way. So the favorite uh, route is uh, ETH0, and ETH1 is just the fallback route. So what is RP filter, RP filter supposed to do? Should it accept packets on ETH1 or only on ETH0? Um, the result uh, is that almost all implementation uh, access packets only from ETH0. But again, uh, IP6 tables uh, behaves differently here. It's slightly related. Uh, the road cause is slightly is the same as the, for the previous example. Uh, this is because, um, yeah, this implementation uh, constrained the route lookup uh, for uh, IP6 RP filter. But yeah, again, that's maybe something we can talk about later uh, if we have time. Uh, these are problems that probably could be worked on uh, in the kernel, at least to make the, uh, the, pro the different implementation behave similarly. Uh, but there are also problems that really are more fundamental problems and that are not uh, only dependent on how the code is written. So let's talk about policy routing. Policy routing, uh, for those who don't know, is when we use uh, different uh, routing tables uh, filled with different routes, and we jump from one table to the other depending on some uh, particular uh, patterns. So here, for example, we have the main routing table that uses uh, ETH0. Uh, and we use ETH1 for uh, table 100. And we decide if we, if we do our lookup uh, in the main table or in table 100, depending on the destination port. So here, if destination port is 50,000, we jump to table 100, and if not, we jump or we stay in the main routing table. So let's see what happens. And in this case, what happens is that only the RP filter CCTL, so the IPv4 so, uh, will jump to uh, table 100. So it will route packets, it will accept packets from ETH1 if the source port is 50,000. So here, RP filter uh, just swap the source and destination port, which probably is intuitive because actually that's what happens for the IP address. Uh, but we'll see that uh, it's not always the right solution. 
And for all the other implementation, uh, it's simple. Uh, the destination port is not taken into account, so we just never jump to table 100. So jumping to table 100 when we have source uh, port uh, 50,000 might look like the good idea because when we send the packet to destination port, the answer will uh, come back with the um, uh, ports, uh, source and destination port swapped. But that's not always the case, uh, especially with uh, UDP tunnels like uh, VXLAN or Geneve. We always use the same destination port, and in this case, this behavior is not appropriate. So let's do policy routing, but on something different. Uh, let's use uh, a packet field that uh, we can't swap between uh, the request and the response. So let's use the DS field. DS field is kind of like the TOS for IPv4 or the traffic class uh, for IPv6. Uh, the, those should be obsolete and should be replaced by DS field. But yeah, you get the idea of what it is. So let's see what happens and if there are some differences uh, between our different RP filter implementations. And actually, all implementations work more or less the same way. Uh, I'll leave some uh, details, uh, but we can consider for this talk that they behave the same way. So what happens is that if the DS field uh, from the return pass matches uh, the IP rule, then uh, we do the route lookup uh, in the um, table 100. So again, that probably looks intuitive, uh, but in reality, the DSCP uh, doesn't have to be mirrored uh, on the return pass. So if the, um, if the return packets uh, don't have the same DSCP value than the outgoing packets, we're not going to jump in the same table and uh, RP filter will break connectivity. And we can also do policy routing based not on uh, IP uh, uh, packets or IP packets fields, but on metadata of the, of the packets. For example, uh, we could use the packet mark, the socket user ID, uh, the input interface, and more, but we are only going to consider these examples. So packet mark. Um, most of, well, all of the RP filter implementation won't take the packet mark into account for uh, doing their route lookup. Uh, because the problem is that, uh, again, we need to have the same pocket mark on outputs and on input to get, uh, to jump to the right table. And often uh, it's uh, difficult enough to have the pocket mark uh, being symmetric uh, on uh, input and output. So we have to use a special, a special options uh, to make uh, RP filter, no matter the implementation, uh, respect the, um, the packet mark. And we have also problems with a socket user ID. So we can jump uh, to a different routing table based on the um, user ID of the socket uh, that sends the packet. So that's for locally generated uh, packets. But on the return pass, of course, we don't receive the packet from a socket. We receive them directly from uh, a network interface. And we don't even know yet uh, on which socket uh, it will be uh, delivered. So all the RP filter implementation uh, make the route lookup with uh, socket or the UID, user ID zero. So as if it was sent by root. And for input interface, uh, we have the same kind of problem. Uh, so if we do um, some policy routing based on the input interface, uh, for in uh, when we send a packet that has just been routed, we know uh, on which input interface we received it. But on the return pass, uh, how should we do our route lookup? If we want to 
reverse input and output interface, then we should uh, say the input interface is the actually the output interface we would use, but this also is not known uh, all the time. This uh, depends on where the, the rule is uh, on the NetFilter hook. So that uh, depends not only on the implementation, but also on where uh, the, the rule is uh, inserted. So to summarize the problem with policy routing, we have different set of metadata of available in the transmission and reception paths. We have packet information that might be different on transmit and receive paths, and even for um, something as obvious as source and destination port where we say, well, we should just swap the source and destination port, that doesn't work all the time. So really, we have a fundamental asymmetry between the receive and the transmission path, which makes uh, policy routing mostly incompatible with RP filter. So to summarize uh, the whole talk, uh, RP filter, even if we consider just the, gen the um, theoretical part of it and only the IETF work, it's not a just a simple on-off functionality. We have to select which flavor of the algorithm we want to use. For advanced al uh, algorithms, we, ha we need some cooperation with a dynamic routing daemon. Uh, we might need for, uh, if you remember, algorithm B, uh, some uh, special configuration from the uh, administrator. Also, we have to keep in mind that uh, RPF was designed for routers and especially for ISPs, not for N host. And yeah, uh, routing daemon, I talked about it. And then we have uh, the implementation. Uh, so we have uh, five different implementations for RP filter, which are hard to keep synchronized. Uh, we have all the complexity of how the kernel manages uh, the kernel route lookups and that uh, has some side, side effects uh, on the implementations. Uh, there are some things we could improve, like the handling of equal cost multipass uh, in order to make all implementation behave uh, similarly. But there are also some fundamental incompatibilities with advanced routing, uh, in particular uh, every time, well, or many times where we use IP rules. Also, we don't support, and we can't really support uh, currently uh, the advanced RP filter algorithms because uh, we need some uh, cooperation with uh, BGP daemon. Okay, so thank you, and time for questions. Yeah, so the question is, uh, can we detect if uh, automatically if some IP rules are going to create problems uh, when we use RP filter? Um, we could at least detect that uh, we have some special IP rules and then uh, consider this is a potential problem for RP filter. But the biggest problem is, yeah, what are we going to do uh, if we uh, activate RP filter and we detect that uh, there's going to be a problem, do we just disable RT RP filter entirely? Uh, because there's no correct way uh, for some of these IP rules, there's just no correct way to handle the problem uh, automatically. We need some help from the, the administrator. Yes. Is this primary coming to avoid the denial of service effects that we cannot 
Yes. So, uh, yeah, the question is, is it primarily, primarily a mean to uh, um, uh, manage the problem, to handle the problem of IP spoofing on the internet? Yes. Uh, from the IETF point of view, and the reason why RPF was uh, designed uh, by the IETF, yeah, that's the main reason. That's really the reason. Yeah. Yes. So, how does that work? so um, what the IETF recommends is that uh, you activate uh, RPF as uh, close to the customer as possible, and if possible, uh, even on the first router. And then, if you have a very big uh, broadcast network behind this, well, probably uh, you also have also security problems. Uh, if you have a big uh, um, uh, Ethernet segment. Yeah, again. <laughs> well, if it works for the router, that's good. But why do we enable it on the end host then, on Linux? I mean, if Linux is not running on the router, but on the end host. Oh, uh, on Linux, we can uh, activate it on a router or the end host. Uh, all RP filter implementation, they work similarly on the router, on routers, on a, and on end host. It just make less sense on the end host because if it's not going to change anything uh, for the IP spoofing. Yeah, again. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yes, uh, repeat the question. Uh, the question is, should we disable it uh, on rel uh, by default? Uh, I know this question has been uh, answered already uh, some years ago, and it was said that uh, no, we shouldn't disable it by default because it's security and we don't disable uh, security. And there's no really technical um, argumentation. It's just a fear of accepting uh, packets that were uh, not accepted before. So, um, yeah, the, the reason is this. <laughs> No more question? Okay. Thank you.